Hi, I'm Hella Brand. I'm the physician assistant who works at Banner Alzheimer's Institute. I'm so glad you could all join today for a discussion on as dementia progresses. We're going to be looking specifically at the middle or moderate stage of Alzheimer's disease. Let's talk first about what our objectives are for the class today. First off, we want to talk about what are the changes in memory, thinking, and functional abilities as a person progresses from early stage to moderate stage Alzheimer's disease. This might also include looking at changes in mood, behavior, and personality. We'll outline the common issues or concerns with which we have to be focused during the moderate stage of Alzheimer's disease. We'll spend some time discussing medications and treatment options to manage the symptoms of Alzheimer's disease and those associated with dementia as well. And along with that, we'll include some discussion on other strategies or interventions with which we might approach Alzheimer's disease symptoms. And lastly, we'll be focusing on concerns related specifically to being a caregiver. So first off, we know Alzheimer's disease is a risk associated with aging. It's not a normal part of aging. Um, and it has some very definite, what we call hallmark features that we can see on autopsy. And that's what you're looking at in the picture. And that's the amyloid plaque. There's a somewhat predictable flow or sequence to how the changes occur but it's unique to everybody. When we talk about Alzheimer's disease in the very beginning, we're talking about an insidious onset with progressive decline. What does that mean? That means that we look at the past, maybe the last two, three years, maybe the last three, four years, and we can't identify a specific time that the symptoms started. It's only as we look collectively at how symptoms have become more manifest or more prominent over time that we can begin to identify roughly when changes began to occur and how they've occurred over time. So it is literally like a snake in the grass. It sneaks up on us. The predominant symptom that we notice first off is forgetfulness. But we notice also that other areas of the brain may be affected as well. And specifically, that can include language, the ability to use words, to formulate thoughts, to have more complex decision-making processes. We can look at calculations or the ability to solve problems. Orientation to time and place is another area that can become affected early on. And then we can see changes in judgment or decision-making processes. So the initial symptom is memory loss. And then we notice over a period of time that we see changes in a person's ability to function as well. And when we're doing a workup for Alzheimer's disease, what we want to make sure of is that there is nothing else that can be accounting for the symptoms. And the most important thing is never do we make a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease in the context of delirium. What is that? Delirium is what occurs when somebody becomes ill or has medications that can cause uh, significant confusion as a side effect. So let's just review real quickly. In the early stage of Alzheimer's disease, you would have noticed that over a period of, say, two to four years, your person would have been experiencing changes in short-term memory. And let's remember that in the very early stages, it's short-term memory that's affected. That's what they did five minutes ago, what they had for breakfast, what they did two weeks, even two years ago. One of the challenges in recognizing Alzheimer's disease in the early stage and getting to a point of diagnosis is the fact that in very early stage, people can compensate. They can cover up for some of the weaknesses or difficulties that they're having. We frequently see in, in the clinic people coming in um, and taking copious lists, uh, making notes. Um, and they've got stickers all over to help them remember uh, what it is they need to do, where they need to be, what they've heard from the doctor. But over time, 
those lists don't make sense to them anymore. So they will have taken notes throughout the whole visit and at the bottom not be able to understand or interpret what's been written. And so they become more repetitive. They ask more of the same questions, which obviously is a logical uh, side effect of having short-term memory problem. If I don't remember, I'm going to ask. So when we see this picture of insidious onset over a period of two to four years gradually becoming more prominent, affecting their function, affecting their language, their ability to problem solve, to be oriented to time and place, and to not have those coping strategies work anymore. The stage is set for moderate stage Alzheimer's disease. So let's define the moderate stage. We have a couple of options for that. The most conventional is in the medical model, and that is to look at the results of cognitive testing. So early on, when we diagnosed Alzheimer's disease, we would have done either a mini mental status exam or a Montreal cognitive assessment or other forms of testing, depending on where you had your loved one evaluated. And by convention, at least the mini mental and the MOCA are divided into thirds. There are 30 point tests. And if we look at a score of above 20, that would be consistent with early or mild stage Alzheimer's disease. If we look at a score between 10 to 20, that would be the definition of moderate stage. And less than 10 would be indicative of late or severe or advanced Alzheimer's stage. As a family, you reach the moderate stage when all of a sudden you realize that you can't ignore the symptoms anymore. This is where I often get a panic call saying, he's doing so much worse. It's a drastic change overnight. You'll remember in the early stage, we talked about a person's ability to compensate or cover up for their weaknesses. And what happens in the moderate stage that prompts that panic from families is that that ability to cover up is lost. And so the reality of what they're struggling with is what's facing the family at that point. What's more indicative of the moderate stage is a person's functional abilities. So sometimes we have people who score higher or lower than we would expect on their testing. Sometimes we can see what's called cognitive reserve. So they still have some brain cells that are working there and allow them to score higher on the test than what we're hearing in terms of function. Sometimes we score lower on testing, and that's because language may be more impaired. So the true picture is going to be, what is their functional level? In the early stage, remember we talked about a gradual, slow decline in their ability to carry out tasks that they did efficiently and well. And this can be at work if they're a younger onset Alzheimer's disease. This can be related to the home tasks like cooking, cleaning, driving, managing medications. But in the moderate stage, what becomes impaired is the ability to take care of self. So that's going to be the picture I'm going to be listening for if you're describing to me the changes in uh, your loved one. And lastly, there's a real change in terms of societal needs in moderate stage because this is where we often have to start tapping into community resources like home care agencies, daycare programs, considering assisted living facilities, depending on where somebody is in the process, even hospice programs sometimes. And the greater issue is in the moderate stage, we're really looking at a vulnerable adult. So this is a person who can no longer be left alone. And that means 24-7 supervision. When we look at moderate stage Alzheimer's disease, the short-term memory continues to get worse. The story I expect to hear from you as care providers is the short-term memory is kaput. It's gone. It's 
in one ear and out the other. As soon as I tell her something, it's forgotten, and so she asks me about it more and more. Also with time, you begin to see that even long-term memory now becomes affected in the moderate stage. So initially, that may be having trouble remembering names and relationships of more distant family, like great-grandchildren, grandchildren, then children, and spouses. Um, with time, they may not remember even who's still alive, where family lives, and as time progresses, not recognize even the, the familiar everyday family that they uh, encounter. And they lose the ability to even remember their own personal biographical data. As I said, when that front part of the brain is affected, they can't think logically. They can't organize their thoughts and they can't reason through a situation. And this is what creates the vulnerability that we talk about. They're no longer able to look at a situation and interpret it in a way that would allow them to recognize an emergency and to be able to respond to an emergency. And this is a critical step that you as families often miss because one of the challenges, you're still seeing an adult body and oftentimes a person who still is insisting that they're quite capable of doing everything and taking care of themselves. But if you were to ask them, for instance, what would they do in, in the event of an emergency, you would be surprised to hear that they do not remember 911 as an emergency number. They may say, I would call my son. Where does your son live? In Chicago. What if your son isn't home? I could run to a neighbor's, right? But if you as the spouse are on the ground and unconscious, and this is a plan that you're hearing from your loved one, that's not getting you the attention that they need. The other is that even recognizing environmental stimuli, so things like smoke in a microwave because an incorrect pan has been put in there, water overflowing from a sink and all over the kitchen floor, smoke detectors going off. These are all things that aren't recognized by a person with Alzheimer's disease in the moderate stage. That's why they can't be left alone, never mind the risk for wandering um, away or with more impaired judgment and reasoning um, and the ability, again, to interpret whether it's right or wrong, good or bad, um, and make appropriate decisions. These are people who are vulnerable to exploitation. Uh, they can be easily influenced by people coming to the door, um, by family members who are seeking finances, um, seeking medications. Um, we've had people try to buy houses, boats, go on big cruises, compliments of mom, for instance. So vulnerability is a huge concern in the moderate stage. And when they can't use logic and organize their thoughts and make well-informed decisions, they're said to lack capacity. And this is when it's really important to have powers of attorney in place because it means that you now are acting as their financial and medical decision makers. In the early stage, we talked about the complex tasks around the house having more difficulty and we gradually see that fall off in the very beginnings of the moderate stage. So, the typical story I will hear from you as family is my person's become lazy. And it isn't that they can't still participate in some tasks, they aren't appreciating the need to do the task and they're having more difficulty with it. So what happens is that you as care providers now notice that you start to remind them more or you're doing the tasks with them and then you realize that even that way sometimes they still can't carry out the task and so you have assumed all of the, the roles. This includes things like using technology, so setting the thermostat, using the stove appropriately, 
being able to use the phone to retrieve messages. And one of the last bits of technology that we see trouble with actually is the TV remote, um, such that there can be confusion as to what its role is. So I often hear families uh, talk about their loved one picking up the TV remote and answering it when the phone rings. So they're not able to process what is that sound I'm hearing in the background and how do I answer it? This is what's convenient. It looks somewhat like a phone. As the last of that ability to handle technology and to do any of the household related tasks falls off, then what you notice is the real beginning of the moderate stage where now they begin to have trouble taking care of themselves. Initially, men may not shave as often or not as thoroughly. Uh, wives will often say, yeah, I find I'm having to do touch-ups um, or just prompt him to get in there and shave. Women will often comb the sides of their hair, the front of their hair, but I'll hear, oh, I always have to touch up the back of her hair. So out of sight becomes out of mind. With um, dressing, we often see uh, less decision making. So they'll tend to wear the same clothes. Yes, they can still dress themselves, but they'll tend to wear the same clothes for days on end, even tend to pull them out of the clothes hamper. And then what you notice with time is that they're not able to make decisions based on the weather, for instance. Um, if they feel cold in the house, particularly if they're under um, an air conditioning vent, they may dress in full winter clothes. Um, also, as time goes on, they just have less of an ability to tolerate cold. So we tend to see more um, heavy clothing with time anyway. Um, there can then be difficulty with recognizing in what sequence to put clothing on. Um, so sometimes I will hear, yeah, he's dressing himself, but he comes out and he's got his underwear on over his pants, or he's trying to put my clothes on instead of his clothes, or not know whether it's the front or back, or be able to turn clothing inside out and outside in, for instance. The next part of personal care that gets affected in the moderate stage is eating. So if we think about when children learn to eat, we feed them, we then let them use their fingers to start feeding themselves. They then learn the spoon, the fork, and the last thing they learn is to be able to cut food. That's a higher level of coordination. With moderate stage Alzheimer's disease, the first step that you see getting lost is the ability to cut food. So you will report, yeah, I have to cut food for him. Um, and then I notice that he's using the fork, but he seems to be using the spoon a little bit more. And then I notice the fingers are starting to creep in. As that back part of the brain is more affected and their depth perception and recognition of distance is affected, you may even notice things like they overreach for utensils. So the fork is in front of them about a foot away, but they're reaching 15 inches away. You may also notice that even as they go to sit down, they may misjudge the front edge of a chair or getting in and out of bed, be closer to the edge than they would have been in the past. So those are the changes in the ability to take care of self that are happening throughout the moderate stage. And what you as a care provider will notice is that you are moving from a picture of kind of supervising from afar, keeping an eye on them for safety and for that sensitivity to when you might need to step in and help them, to you realize you're stepping in closer, more directly supervising them, reminding them more, setting up things more for them. So you have to turn the shower on, you have to give them the shampoo, um, you have to help them dry off, um, any, any of those kinds of steps where you are setting up or you're providing direct physical assistance.
So it's a picture of moving from afar to closer to using verbal prompts and then using actual hands-on assistance as time goes on. So one of the challenges with personal care is that the person at this point may not recognize that they're having trouble, but what they do remember is that they are adults and they resent anything that sounds like or feels like to them that you are being a parent, that you are telling them you have to, you should, you ought, why didn't you? And so they will get resentful of that. Um, you may suggest to them that they shower and they will say, I already took a shower or I don't need to shower today because I didn't sweat, I didn't do anything. Your instincts may be at that point to jump in and argue with them but remember, their reasoning and their logical thinking is more and more affected. So the more you try and reason with them, the more you try and convince them why they should or shouldn't do something, the more you're going to encounter either resistance, verbal or physical uh, aggression, irritability or anger. These are uh, very common changes in mood and personality that we can see early on. As the person has given up more of the activities that they used to do and don't have a sense of what to do for the day, if we as a community, as family, have not found ways to replace activities that they can no longer do, it creates a void and a sense of hopelessness for people with Alzheimer's disease. And when there's hopelessness, there's depression. So that's another common change that we can see is depression. Um, as they worry about where they need to be or what's happening next or can't reason through a situation, they can become more easily anxious. We can see this even if families step out of the room for a minute. Um, it can create a real sense of separation anxiety. So uh, much like young mothers would say, all I want is two minutes in the bathroom by myself. Um, a caregiver for somebody with Alzheimer's disease might have the same kind of a, a complaint. Uh, these are um, challenges trying to talk on the phone when a, a loved one has Alzheimer's disease because they may be there asking, who is this? What are you doing? Who are you talking to? They may have other changes in their, um, in their thinking and therefore their behavior and that they may be more suspicious um, or paranoid and so they may be questioning why it is that you're talking to this person and not understand who it is you're talking to or why that person is there. So we can see separation anxiety, we can see generalized anxiety, we can see what we call anticipatory anxiety. So remember the person has more difficulty keeping track of time as they move more into the moderate stage. So three minutes can feel like an hour to them. Five minutes can feel like it's been three weeks. And this is where we often begin to see wandering. As you are used to leaving your person alone for periods of time and you've left them a message that you've run to the store, you'll be back in one hour, A, the short-term memory is more impaired, so now they don't remember where you said they were going, where you were going. B, they're not understanding what an hour means, and so you're not there. They're feeling anxious because you make sense of the day. They don't know where you are, exactly how long you've been gone, and that generalized anxiety goes up, that impaired judgment and reasoning kicks in, and they leave the house looking for you, sure that something has happened. So the picture that you should be hearing in moderate stage Alzheimer's disease is of increasing dependence. They're no longer able to do the household related tasks and they're progressively more and more dependent on you to organize the day, to make sense of the day for them and to help them with personal care.
So we've already alluded to some of the issues with moderate stage Alzheimer's disease, specifically behaviors. And I think if I polled each of you, you probably would be able to list four, five, or six different variations on a theme. But as I said, we can see anger, irritability, suspiciousness, paranoia, wandering, obsessiveness, hoarding, spitting, kicking, swearing. We can see disinhibition. They can be more sexually disinhibited, try to disrobe, um, come on to other family members, be overly friendly with strangers more impulsive, so you have them in a store and they see a candy bar and they are going to pick it up. More childlike in their understanding of and their ability to function in the world. Not only is memory becoming more affected in the moderate stage, but the languages as well. And let's remember that language has four components to it. One is the ability to understand. Two is the ability to express oneself. Three is the ability to read. And lastly is the ability to write. And all of these become progressively impaired in moderate stage so that at some point they're no longer able to read or write. And their ability to express and understand becomes much, much simpler. And this can take a number of forms. One you'll notice that you have to give very simple directions. No longer can you give them three or four things to do. A key thing to remember with language is that the person with Alzheimer's disease becomes very attuned to what your face is saying and what your body language is saying. Even when they can't understand the words, they can understand what they're seeing in body language. So you need to be very careful if you're feeling stressed or angry or anxious because they will feed off of it. They will essentially mimic what you are feeling. So we want them to be as stress-free, as anxiety-free as they can be. That means that sometimes you have to hide your own stress. You have to put on literally the happy face. And I realize that can be a significant challenge as a care provider when you yourself may be feeling the same symptoms of anxiety and depression, worrying about how are we going to make it through, feeling tired from assuming all of these responsibilities. In the early stage, as you've been working with social workers or people from the Alzheimer's Association or other community agencies, you would have been developing a plan, financial and legal planning, for what the needs might be as time marches on with Alzheimer's disease. And this is the time that that plan goes into effect. I already commented on the powers of attorney are, are now in effect as they can't make financial and medical decisions. This is where you now begin to tap into what are those extra resources that can help me help my person, that can give me a break, that can give them a sense of some independence and things to look forward to and keep them safe. So this is where we say we're using plan B. We're looking at those resources and we're looking at what do we need to make those resources happen. We've talked about vulnerability, that ability to understand a situation, to recognize an emergency and be able to respond to it. But vulnerability is also just that sense of psychological comfort. And I think this is the other little pearl that we want to hang on to in terms of where does anxiety come from. So if I can't make sense of the world and you're leaving me alone. And even in early stage, we see this if people are being left alone. It creates distress. It creates angst. And what we want is psychological comfort. And at a point when they're feeling that angst or distress with being left alone, that's that moment of vulnerability. That's that moment that we want to step in provide the 24-7 supervision, the constancy of care and support, 
the predictability of routine so that they have that sense of psychological comfort. That means that we're also ensuring their overall safety because we're always there to make sure that they're not turning the stove on and leaving it on, that they're not using inappropriate products in the microwave, that they're not getting out of the house because we've put extra locks on the doors. All of those enter into how do we keep them safe. And then even more is whether we are going to need to or want to place our loved one. That's a highly personal decision. There's no right or wrong to that. There are those who feel strongly they want to keep their loved one at home. It's totally possible, but only when there is extra help in the home. Things can change in a moment, uh, even for the health and welfare of the care provider. We often worry, in fact, about the care provider um, dying first, uh, kind of the cumulative effects of stress. And in general, we're looking at somebody who is aging themselves and has health issues. So we need to pay attention to the welfare and emotional and physical well-being of you, the caregiver, and whether it's feasible to continue to keep somebody at home. We talked earlier about delirium. We call that the voice of dementia. So as time goes on and language is more impaired and there's a disconnect in terms of what a person is feeling and expressing to you, they may not be able to tell us that they feel like they're coming down with something or that they're hurting in a specific area. Fairly early on, we may notice that they complain of things like back pain for almost a week straight. So you make an appointment with the doctor, but by the time you get to the doctor, they say, what pain? I don't have any pain. So it's, it's important that you play the detective and when you are seeing these kinds of complaints or seeing the grimace that goes along with it or the reluctance to move an arm or a leg, that's when you need to translate to the doctor or advocate for your loved one that this is what they've been saying, this is the situation under which I've noticed it, and it's been going on for about this long, okay? When we talked about Alzheimer's disease in general, we talked about this sort of insidious onset and gradual slow decline. When we see a very sudden change in hours or uh, days that can be more confusion, agitation, or swing the other way, they can be so out of it that you almost are questioning whether they're alive, they're not responsive. That's the delirium. That's the body acting out the fact that there's something going on medically or physically. The typical scenario is a urinary tract infection, but we can look at things like pneumonia, viral illnesses, or a whole host of um, other medical or physical issues, changing kidney function, liver function, that can uh, create that change in level of alertness and confusion. So when we see that very sudden change, like I said, over hours to days, that's a marked difference from their sort of general confusion, that's when you want to call your primary care physician and say, I think there's something going on. We need to come in and get checked out. And in the absence of any findings, then sometimes we're just seeing a gradual progression in the um, Alzheimer's disease and its symptoms, and we may need to treat with medications. Let's move on now to talking about what the goals for treating Alzheimer's disease are and what the treatments are that we do use. Our primary focus is on trying to slow or hold the progression of memory and cognitive symptoms, but we can't reverse and prevent them from happening. We're literally just slowing the course with medications. 
We want to be able to try and hold function for as long as we can or improve a person's ability to do something. We want to improve behaviors. We want to be able to improve mood. And we also want to make sure that we're keeping an eye towards maintaining weight and appetite because as the disease progresses, we can often see a change in food preferences and people move towards uh, sweeter foods and not want to eat certain foods. And so if we're not recognizing that transition or not recognizing the need to um, provide more cues for eating, we can begin to see weight loss. So it's one of the reasons that you see weight is always taken when your loved one is going to a doctor's visit. We want to monitor and improve sleep we can often see people have trouble falling asleep, staying asleep, or getting up unnecessarily early. We can see them sleeping more during the daytime and sometimes uh, excessively during the daytime and then not sleeping at night so that we can see this complete reversal of day and night. And that's when we want to be able to stabilize sleep patterns. We especially want to feel that you as family, as care providers, uh, whether in the community or as family care providers, are receiving the necessary education and information you need to understand the changes that your loved one is experiencing, to understand what the best interventions are for you to use, and to be aware of those valuable community resources. We want particularly to help you focus on the content, on the quality of life for your loved one. Our policy is to have people feel engaged rather than isolated. And this has been a concern over the years that uh, people when they were diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease were given the diagnosis and essentially sent home with their families. And, and families had to fend for themselves in terms of what can they do for their loved one. Um, and over time, experienced a real sense of isolation and withdrawal from other family members, from friends, and from community events. And what we encourage wholeheartedly very early on is to find those activities that still have meaning that can be engaged in, that you can do together, or that your loved one can do in conjunction with a neighbor or other family member or a friendly visitor from a home care agency. When we focus on finding meaningful activity and helping them accomplish that, that's how we affect quality of life. We want to make sure that in assuring their safety and psychological comfort that we're reducing risk for things like secondary disability. This would also include making sure that we are managing medical issues. So making sure that their blood pressure is in a good range so that we don't invite the risk of stroke or heart attack that if they're having gradually more unsteadiness or difficulty with their walking, that we're getting physical therapy in a timely fashion, that we're using walkers as appropriately to make them safer with walking because we want to avoid the falls that might produce fractures and fractures needing surgery and surgery then needing hospitalization and stays in rehab facilities. So reducing the risk for secondary disability is a very important part of treatment of Alzheimer's disease. When we look at medications for cognition, the memory or the thinking component of Alzheimer's disease, we have two classes of drugs that we can use. In the early stage, we use the cholinesterase inhibitors. What is that? It's a fancy word for medications like Aricept, or its generic form is Dinepazil, Galantamine, or Razadine, Exelon, or Rivastigmine. These are medications that help make a chemical available in the brain that we know gets depleted in the early stage. These are medications that we start slowly, 
We typically use a half dose, and each one has a, a different starting dose. So Dinepazil, for instance, is a five milligram dose. We do the half dose every day for four weeks, and then if tolerated, we increase to the next level of medication. So in Dinepazil, that might be 10 milligrams. In the rivastigmine patch, we might go from 4.6 to 9.5. And all of these then have options to go higher based on tolerability. These are drugs that are associated with about a 10% incidence of GI complaints. So if we're starting these at any point along the way, we want to watch for things like upset stomach, queasiness, nausea, vomiting, frequent loose stools, or diarrhea. We want to watch for a fall off in appetite. Sometimes people will experience a six, seven pound weight loss as the medications are started. Dinepazil in particular, but certainly all three of these drugs can potentially cause vivid dreams. So this would be your reporting to me that your loved one seems to have very active dreams. The loved one might even report to you about having these technicolor dreams or nightmares. Uh, they could go either way. I have some people who say, oh, please don't take the medication away from me. I really like my dreams. Other people are clearly disturbed by their dreams. So it, it can be a side effect of the medication. You can also see complaints like runny nose, and they can lower blood pressure. In the moderate stage, we add Nemenda or Memantine. Again, we start slowly. We have options for one of two avenues with Memantine. The traditional is the immediate release, which is generic Memantine. We start with five milligrams and we build over a period of month to 10 milligrams twice a day. The newer formulary is the Nemenda XR, which we start at seven milligrams and build over time to 28 milligrams. Again, GI side effects can be a concern with this medication. We tend to see constipation more as a side effect with the memantine, diarrhea more with the extended release. Nemenda can have paradoxical confusion as one of its side effects, and that would be a picture of a relative level of confusion or clarity. Last week, you start the medicine this week, and you call me up and say, wow, she's not putting words together that are making sense, or just seems agitated, more distressed, and it seems to coincide with the onset of the medication. Because it acts in the brain, it also has the potential for dizziness and headaches. So those would be the main side effects. So while we look at the cholinesterase inhibitors or Nemenda as memory pills, they also can have some effect on mood and behavior. And really what we're preserving with them over time is function. With all of these medications, it's important, as I said, we start low, we go slow. It's important for you as family members to make notes. When did we start the medication? When did we notice any kind of side effects? Because sometimes it's only when we go to the higher dose, for instance. Um, people might tolerate Dinepazil 5 milligrams, but when we go to 10, that's too much. So those are medications that we use for the memory or the cognitive or the thinking symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. When we look at treating the other symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, we're talking about treating mood, behavior, sleep, and even pain. Important in treating all of those is to recognize that there are other strategies or interventions that we can use that we refer to as non-pharmacological. In other words, not using medications to treat symptoms that we're seeing. 
Some basic rules of the road to remember are that we want to avoid fatigue in the person with Alzheimer's disease, that we need to create breaks throughout the day for them so that they can kind of recharge their batteries, restore themselves. If we keep them running full tilt all day, we're liable to see more confusion, more anxiety or agitation later in the day and into the evening. We want to create a predictable daily routine and minimize change as much as possible. They will function better and feel safer and more secure in an environment where they know what's happening and where things are. It's when you create change with things like traveling uh, that you often see behaviors emerge as they try and reorient to even a place that they've been before, but maybe it's been a year since they were back east uh, last summer. Um, we often get panic calls on how agitated somebody has become and how confused they've become. We can't underscore how important it is to have that predictable routine and to realize whether they can or cannot handle the stress of travel it doesn't mean that we can't introduce new activities or environments to them. It just means we have to do it sensitively. We want to be able to provide meaningful engagement to them. One, it keeps them from getting distracted with other behaviors. So much like kids, if they are bored, they create their own distraction. And we don't want to have negative kinds of distractions set in nor do we want to have depression or anger or resentment because they have nothing to look forward to. We want to make sure that when we recognize those early signs of illness that we're getting them in to the doctors early, not later, and that we try and use as much as possible the primary care physician's office rather than the emergency room because that is a tremendously disruptive and anxiety-provoking, disorienting environment for somebody with Alzheimer's disease. We want to make sure that in our communication, in what's in the environment and the daily structure, that we're not giving them too much information, that we're not overloading them. So an example would be Remember, they need to be more concrete. They need simpler choices. We don't want to say, what do you want for dinner? We could have the chicken or the beef, but I've got some peas or vegetables that could be green beans or the baked beans. What do you think? It's going to overwhelm them. Too many choices that they can't hold on to, so we avoid that. Misleading stimuli, we want to pay attention to if we are seeing behavioral changes that might include things like you reporting hallucinations. We need to pay attention to in what context are those being noted because often it's things like mirrors or reflective surfaces, windows, shades that aren't pulled close or tight at night and we're getting this kind of shimmering light through that can be misperceived by the person with Alzheimer's disease. Um, pictures in the environment, dolls, all kinds of things can be triggers for the person misperceiving something in the environment and being disturbed by it. So that's what we mean when we say avoiding misleading or overstimuli, not giving too much verbal information, giving it at a level and a pace that they can understand and watching what's in the environment. Not too much noise, not too many people, not too much disruption in the routine. And that means that one of the greatest challenges to you as the care provider is that you have to constantly adapt. You constantly have to modify the way you are approaching the person uh, because they're not able to. We have to remember that this is a disease process going on in the brain. It's very easy to interpret it as willful behaviors, um, especially when we have history of interacting with somebody a certain way. But they cannot change. So accepting where they are, adapting to where they are, changing your communication so that you help them feel safe and comfortable and promote a sense of interaction. And I think probably the biggest tip is to not challenge or correct 
statements that you're going to hear from the person with Alzheimer's disease because we will hear statements that you will say are not true, that are false beliefs or delusions. When we look at treating mood features, obviously all the things that we just talked about in terms of creating meaningful activity, a daily schedule to look forward to goes a long way to improving depression and reducing anxiety. But Sometimes we need a little extra help over and above that, particularly if somebody is more suicidal or so depressed that they have no energy to bring towards trying activities or programs, for instance. So in that case, we use antidepressants. And mind you, when we say for mood, although they're antidepressants, most of them also address anxiety as well. The most common ones used are the ones from the class called SSRIs. You might recognize the older ones as Paxil and Prozac, for instance. We try and avoid those because they have negative side effects, A, in elderly people, and B, specifically in people with dementia. But the newer ones with sertraline, which is generic for Zoloft, citalopram, generic for Celexa, and escitalopram, generic for Lexapro, can be very, very effective. Start with a low dose, and then you build up and maximize the dose before you can actually say that the medicine is not working. So start low, but go and maximize before trying something else. Sometimes we use other antidepressants based on the symptoms that we're seeing or if we're clearly not seeing a response to the SSRIs or they have intolerance to those medications. In particular, one of the ones we might use is called mirtazapine. We use that in particular if somebody is depressed, not eating well, and not sleeping well because the primary side effects are it makes someone feel sleepy we give it at night, and it also makes someone feel hungry. So if we're seeing weight loss that isn't responding to some of the strategies we're going to talk about in a few minutes, mirtazapine can be a great tool in the toolbox. You may also hear of medications like venlafaxine or Effexor, bupropion or Wellbutrin, for instance. In general, we want to avoid the class of drugs called benzodiazepines. These are medications you would recognize because in, they're all generic and they end in PAM, P-A-M. So lorazepam, diazepam, temazepam. These would be drugs you would know as Valium or Ativan, for instance. These are medications that can have a higher risk of confusion and a higher risk of falls in the elderly and general and again specifically in those with dementia. Tricyclics, these would be your amitriptyline or your noratriptyline or Elevil for instance, have the same negative effects in people with dementia. And uh, fluoxetine or paroxetine um, are again medications that are on lists not to be used as people age and in elderly population because they can cause more confusion. That would be your Paxil and your Prozac medications. When we look at treating behavior, our first step is always, have we done everything in terms of stress-free environment, consistency of daily routine, slowness, reassurance and communication, simplifying the communication, creating activity that engages them and makes them feel happy. That's our first approach with behaviors, but if separate from that, we're still seeing an escalation. It's not responding. We can't distract them. We can't get off of it. Uh, the behaviors are happening more frequently, more severely. They're lasting longer. Um, they have more punch to them, literally, um, so they are more verbally aggressive or uh, more frankly paranoid to the point that they won't even take medications or eat because they're afraid you're trying to poison them, for instance. Then we have to use medications to treat the behavioral symptoms. Here again, 
we may use if somebody is not already on either the cholinesterase inhibitors or the memantine or the nemenda that we talked about, those cognitive medications, they can have a good effect on mild to moderate behavioral features as well as mood features. So we always want to make sure those are on board. Our second choice then would be to use the antidepressants. Why would we do that? Well, if we look at depression on one end of the continuum for mood and we look at anxiety on the other end, they're going to meet in the middle as behavioral manifestations. So if we think about negativity um, being associated with depression, I have low energy, there's nothing to look forward to, that can come out as cynicism, pessimism, negative context, nobody can do anything right, pointing the finger or accusing people all of the time. Um, anxiety can feel unsettling. It can make somebody feel edgy. We can see more easy irritability, for instance. And so that meeting in the middle as those sort of behavioral manifestations is exactly why we might use an antidepressant first. Cost is cheaper and the side effect profile is also better than using some of the higher levels. But if those avenues are not working, sometimes we do have to go then to what we call the atypical antipsychotics. That means the newer generation of psychotic medications that are out on the market that have sort of supplanted the older ones like Haldol or Haloperidol. In this class, the more commonly used one is quetiapine or Seroquel, but we would also use Risperidone or Olanzapine, which would be a Zyprexa. The concerns with using the atypical antipsychotics is the number one is that they have a black box warning. You've probably seen the commercials on TV saying elderly people with dementia should not take these medications. They're all that we have to use with symptoms like paranoia or suspiciousness or hallucinations that are disturbing uh, because these are medications that get used for chronic conditions like schizophrenia or bipolar. So we use them, but we use them judiciously. So again, always what are we doing in terms of communication and environment? Have we addressed with lower classes of medication? But now we need to use the antipsychotics. We're going to start low. We're going to build up slowly, but we're going to build to a point where we get reduction of symptoms without the side effects. And again, just as we used seizure medications for mood, we may also use those on occasion for behavioral symptoms as well. When we look at sleep features, the most important strategy is what we call sleep hygiene. That means that we want to create as predictable a bedtime routine and ritual as we can, and on the other end, a predictable awake time in the morning. We want to make sure that we have low levels of lighting at night so that everything is about quieting, about getting darker, about getting ready for bed. In the morning, we want to have light. We want to have those curtains open. We want to sit out on the patio if we can and absorb 10 minutes of sun. If we're using these sort of strategies to help someone sleep and we're still having issues, then we want to try medications like trazodone, which actually is a mood medication, but its main effect is that it can cause sleepiness. So we can use anywhere from 50 to 200 milligrams of that and see if that helps improve sleep. Mirtazapine or Remeron is the antidepressant I mentioned earlier that has sedation or sleepiness as one of its side effects. Just over-the-counter melatonin is often an effective strategy, anywhere from 3 to 12 milligrams. So this is something you can try on your own and see if it helps your person sleep. And then from there, we would use, if need be, the atypical antipsychotics. 
because they have uh, sedation or sleepiness as one of their side effects as well. I should add in there that um, even sometimes using an antidepressant like citalopram can be effective depending on what we hear. So if somebody tells me that the reason they're not able to fall asleep at night is because they can't shut their brain off, the real problem is that they're anxious. They're trying to hold on to too many things. They're worrying about what needs to get done tomorrow or what's going to happen tomorrow. So if I treat underlying anxiety, they're able to sleep at night. Again, as we saw with the medications for mood, we don't want to use the benzodiazepines. We don't want to use those Valiums and those lorazepams or Ativans to help people sleep because while they may help people fall asleep, they don't help them stay asleep. And when they wake up, they're more confused and more at risk for falls. We also don't want to use antihistamines or drugs that have PM in the formula, Excedrin PM, Tylenol PM. Those all contain diphenhydramine, which is your antihistamine, high risk for confusion and falls. One of the things I want to talk about next is the importance of treating pain in people with dementia. I can't stress enough how much untreated pain can be a source of behaviors, how pain can cause agitation and aggression and resistance to help with personal care. As somebody hurts and doesn't want to be moved in a, a given direction or way, and you're trying to help them. So treating underlying pain is important. If there's a source of chronic pain, we need to treat chronically because remember, they can't tell us when it's feeling worse. So we definitely want to make sure that if there's chronic source of pain, we treat chronically, that we don't use pain medication as what we call a PRN or per need because they can't remember that that's the system. So we don't treat as needed. One of the most effective pain strategies can be just routine acetaminophen, which is generic Tylenol, up to three grams or 3,000 milligrams a day. And that includes if for any reason your loved one has any kind of combination products. So that would be like your Vicodin, where you have a combination of an opioid and uh, Tylenol. We don't want to exceed three grams total of Tylenol. Very effective for mild to moderate pain. I generally advise using even the extra strength Tylenol or acetaminophen and starting with at least twice a day at bedtime so that pain is not an issue as they sleep. And in the morning, because so many times it's that morning stiffness that's hard. And then as they get up and moving, they do better. If there are greater issues of pain, certainly then we have to use higher levels of medication, so opioids when appropriate for moderate to severe pain. And you want to work with your pain specialist to make sure that it's the lowest possible dose, but that you treat appropriately because, again, this affects quality of life. You'll notice that I say use other strategies as well. Let's not forget the psychological comfort that comes from things like topical analgesics. So. If you have a sore joint, think about how that Bengay might feel as that heat kind of soaks in and bathes the joint. There's a lot of comfort from that. Using moist heat, using um, massage, these are all things that can be helpful. If it's a newer onset kind of condition, then even in a course of physical therapy as an adjunct to pain management is advised. We want to move on now to one of the concerns we talked about in moderate stage can be weight loss. So sources of weight loss, those kind of triggers, are that pre, what we call pre-morbid, before the disease state concern with weight and eating habits. Remember, as time goes on, the person needs distant supervision, closer supervision, setup and physical assistance. And if we've missed that stage, 
where they need more cues to help them eat or to put the fork um, or spoon in their hand and to help them get started with eating or to keep them focused. Sometimes people will even fall asleep in the middle of eating and we need to remind them. Um, or perceptually, they're not perceiving all of the food on their plate. Maybe we need to be scraping the food into the middle of the plate or turning the plate around. These are all missed opportunities. And if we don't catch those, we're going to see the weight loss. Diabetic management certainly is one of the big triggers for uh, weight loss. So we have this conflict with your endocrinologist who wants to keep the blood sugars down around 120, and those of us in the dementia field who say, we're relaxing the standards here. As time goes on, remember I said people have changes in food preferences. They move towards sweets. They stop eating certain foods, particularly salads or vegetables, tougher cuts of meat, and they gravitate more towards comfort foods and to softer foods with time. If we're insisting on that perfect balanced diet, we're in conflict with where their tastes are going to be. A key part of what can affect appetite, certainly, is just diminished senses. So as we get older, our sense of smell may not be as great, for instance. A t sense of taste may not be as acute or as sharp as it would have been. So that certainly can contribute. Depression, right? Some people feed depression, but a lot of people starve depression. I feel sad. I don't even have the energy to summon to eat, so weight loss can be seen. And as we talk now about the eating strategies, how do we improve eating and appetite? When those aren't working and we're still seeing weight loss despite all of our best efforts, then our last option is to consider failure to thrive. Is this more that we're looking at nearing sort of the end of life in Alzheimer's disease, that our best efforts are not helping them hold on to the calories and they're just losing weight? Or is there something going on medically? Let's not forget that we're still coexisting with other disease states or illnesses just by virtue of aging. So is it possible that there's something like a cancer process going on somewhere in the body, depending on how quickly the weight is falling off, for instance? So let's remember, first of all, that Eating is a very social activity. We all tend to do better when there are other people around us. We tend to fix better meals when we're fixing for a group of people than we do for ourselves. So we want to create the opportunity. Rather than have them sit by themselves, let's sit down with them. Or let's invite family or friends to come in and sit with them. Or let's go out to eat because oftentimes that's a trigger to get people to eat. If I have somebody who's kind of more concerned with their weight and how they say they're not hungry and food looks overwhelming, I might do things like have smaller, more frequent meals during the day. So whatever they'll eat at breakfast, but then I'm going to offer a mid-morning snack, lunch, mid-afternoon snack, dinner, and then a bowl of ice cream after dinner. So it never looks like they're getting a lot of food, but we're stretching those calories throughout the day. I may also trick them, and rather than put the food on a dinner size plate, put it on a luncheon plate so it doesn't look as big to them. If somebody is losing weight, I want abundance of calories in what they're eating during the day. But on the other hand, if they're gaining weight, so we talked earlier about how some people can have more impulsivity control. That means, too, things like if there's a package of cookies, they'll eat a package of cookies rather than filtering their behavior and having two cookies as they might have in the past. So sometimes we have to hide the calories. We have to portion it out or we have to make judicious choices. So for instance, instead of a bowl of Haagen-Dazs ice cream, maybe they can have a frozen yogurt, or maybe they can have a skinny cow that might be 90 calories as opposed to 500 calories. 
So they're still having the quality of life. They're still having foods that they enjoy and are pleasurable, but we're not packing on the calories. Another strategy to employ sometimes is to just give one item at a time. So instead of, again, all of the dinner out on the plate all at once, just give a, a little bowl. Here's your corn, good, here's this, and here's that. So again, they don't feel like they're eating lots of food at once. So the most important is to remember that we need to supervise and assist as necessary so that we're helping them eat at such a time that they're having struggles. One of the associated concerns in Alzheimer's disease over time is an increasing risk for falls. That comes from a number of causes, and the first is that with time, people with Alzheimer's disease just generally become more weak or debilitated. You can see this as they walk less and less. They're no longer maintaining their regular physical activity. They're walking shorter distances, sitting more of the day, so those big leg muscles aren't as strong as they used to be. Along with weakness, they become unsteadier in general. So you'll notice that they may cruise holding on to furniture or that you have started holding on to their elbow or they take your arm and look for support as they're walking. Or they've actually moved to using a walker because they're so unsteady. So having that weakness, maybe having some of those what we call extrapyramidal or those Parkinson-like symptoms, that sort of more stooped posture and that walking slowly and shuffling puts them at risk for falls. Their movements in general become slowed and interestingly enough, the slower you go, the more at risk for falls you have. They have more impairment of their balance and of their coordination as time goes. So even things like on a neurology evaluation, if we ask them to walk and then to turn around when we say, rather than just turning in position and coming back, they may actually walk the steps around. They can have trouble negotiating stepping down from a curb or over a threshold because of their uh, visual perception skills. They're not interpreting the depth and the distance as well as they used to. The net result is that they can fall, have trouble getting up to stand, which creates increased demand on you, or they can be injured. And specifically, the concerns would be hip fracture, compression fracture, fracture of the arms, or head injury. So the way we address this is very early on, an early stage and continuing on as long as we can in moderate stage Alzheimer's disease. We want to have some kind of a regular exercise program, just getting them out for a daily walk or taking the dog for a walk or doing some simple weights or getting them into daycare programs where they do chair exercise programs where balance isn't as important, but they're using their leg muscles and their arm muscles to maintain strength. We want to employ physical and occupational therapy early and then at regular intervals so that we kind of beef them up in terms of strength and their ability to move their balance and their coordination? Do they need adaptive devices? Do they need adaptive techniques to help them get dressed safer, for instance? One of the things that physical and occupational therapists can do if we use agencies is to get out there and do an assessment in the home. What are the environmental risk factors for falling? Are there loose rugs, loose throw rugs? Do we need things like grab bars in the bathroom, in the shower, and at the toilet? Do we need some kind of a rail for them to help pull themselves up out of bed, for instance? So looking at, is the home as safe as it can be? Getting the therapy? Paying attention to whether medications may be contributing to balance or coordination problems, right? If a medication is causing significant dizziness or it's causing what we call orthostatic hypotension. So as they 
stand or change their position, their blood pressure doesn't keep up fast enough, and so they get that kind of lightheadedness. What they need to do is just stand and collect themselves, but they don't always remember that. And an important strategy is to check footwear, and I'm going to say particularly for women. I see people who don't have very good balance at all, and they're coming in in narrow wedge heels or high heels or slip-on shoes like flip-flops where their feet are sliding all over inside the shoes and we really need to let go of those. This is when we want to use walking shoes or like a basic sneaker, not a real thick cushioned wedge because that makes it hard to pick up their feet, but something where they can feel the ground, have some support, and be safer in walking. Also make sure that the footwear is the right size. So many times people keep thinking they're a size 7 because that's what they always were, but if they really go check it out, they need a bigger size shoe, so check that. At night, we always want to make sure that there's some kind of low-level lighting that kind of helps them find their way to the bathroom if they had to uh, get up so that it helps orient them get in and out of the bathroom as safely as possible. And adaptive equipment, certainly we use as appropriate. So a walker, when they're struggling more with their walking, helps keep them more upright, gives them a little bit bigger base of support and therefore improved balance. So we definitely want to use that. Adaptive may also refer to things like a transport wheelchair if they're no longer able to do long distances, but we still want to be able to get them out in the community or to be able to get in and out of doctor's visits. So it can be a whole host of modifications there that are needed, but that can come from working with your physical and occupational therapist or asking your doctor about it. Let's move on to our, our last topic of concern, but certainly not our least, and that is what are the issues related to being a caregiver or to caregiving? In the moderate stage, as we said, this becomes a 24-7 job. It can be exhausting trying to keep up with all the household-related tasks, taking care of someone, trying to deal with behavioral issues if those are going on, trying to get a good night's sleep when your person isn't sleeping well, trying to maintain your energy and eat well even when your person's food preferences have changed. It's easy to become socially isolated. People will often report that friends kind of fall off as time goes by, and, and certainly there's a certain amount of this that we can expect as people age. People move back to be closer to their family. They have their own health and physical issues. Or they're serving as care providers for someone in their own family. So it's easy to become isolated. Family dynamics can be part of a solution, but they can also be part of the problem. So I don't believe mom has a problem, and so I'm not going to pitch in my share. I think that you should know exactly what it is I need, so I'm going to sit and wait for you to offer help rather than me learn to say, here's what I need. So whatever dynamics were going on within the family before certainly may not be better, and that can make caregiving additionally stressful. I mentioned earlier that we worry about the caregiver's health and emotional well-being as much as we do about the person with dementia. They are, you, the caregivers, are at significant risk for deterioration of your own health, physical, and emotional needs. Again, none of this is in a vacuum. So health issues can arise just by virtue of um, aging. And we've had uh, numbers of caregivers who have developed cancer or had strokes and, and had to try and accelerate their plans for their loved one because of that. I think the biggest concern that caregivers often express is there's so much to do. I just have so much, there's not enough time in the course of the day 
You have family members on the side who are serving as cheerleaders, feeling free to offer their comments on what should or shouldn't be done or to comment on how you are or aren't doing your job. You have professionals in their best intention who say, we want you to take care of yourself and how am I going to do all of that? There's just not enough time in the day. I'm one person and I'm human. So when we look at caregiver issues and caregiver concerns, we know, and as I mentioned earlier, that sharing the care makes a big difference. Barriers to this can come from your own reluctance, from a sense of pride or guilt, stoicism, a sense of promises made, I'll never ever place you, I'll never let anybody else come into the house. You can have your own standards of perfectionism. I'm the only one who can do this. Isolation, not having any other family or friends in the area. All of these are barriers to getting additional help and letting you have some breaks. One of the barriers, too, can be that there are a great sense of sort of what we call urban legends or myths about financial concerns. Oh, if I sign up for all techs, they're going to take my house away from me, rather than getting the information and hearing what it is that you need to do and how you qualify and how you're protected as a spouse. The system can make it hard even to get the money that you might be eligible for can take months and a lot of perseverance, uh, filling out forms, making sure that you're getting them in on a timely fashion, following up, having interviews with caseworkers who come out who may or may not understand why your person needs support. We talked earlier, uh, family dynamics can be part of the equation, right? Sometimes if we are specific in our communication, I need to go get my hair done on Saturday, so if you could come be with dad from 12 to 2 is a very specific communication. That may allow other family members to come in and have their own way of interacting with and affecting a loved one's quality of life. On the other hand, some family can be terribly disruptive, and sometimes we have to kind of draw boundaries that this person is not a good one to have around. So basically, if we can get to a point of sharing the care, however we're going to do that, whatever model we can do, or incorporate into the daily routine, that's what's going to allow you to take care of yourself. So our options that we look at in terms of extending the care, it's always easiest to look at What's the volunteer network? Let's start at the core. What have we got in terms of family? Maybe friends or neighbors. Maybe faith community, if you belong to a faith community, because that's a big source of mission and you can target people. Come in for uh, Bible studies or help with transportation or bring home communion services in. Any number of ways that way. Then we look at our outside agencies, so looking at adult day health programs or daycare programs that can create activities and socialization opportunities for the person with dementia. And when you get that on board with a regular predictable routine, it allows you to then schedule time for yourself, whether you go off and just get your hair done, whether you reestablish contacts with friends or with family and just have lunch while your person is at a program. Using home care agencies, we use these initially for friendly visitors or companion care. They can help with transportation, bring in activities, socialization, can help you even with some of what we call that honey-do list. You know, I, I need help with cooking. I'm not a good cook. I don't like my cooking and she certainly doesn't like my cooking. Um, so I'm going to have our home care person make some meals that we just have to warm up, for instance. Same with helping with simple chores and tasks around the house or shopping. As time moves on through the moderate stage and they need help with personal care, we may need to move to medical home care agencies where they have CNAs who have been trained on how to bathe, how to dress, how to help toilet someone. 
And then our other options are to use alternative residences. So this is the assisted living or uh, dementia care facilities. And our last community resource then towards end of life, advanced stage Alzheimer's disease, becomes hospice, that time when they really are homebound, when they are fully dependent for all care, when they're maybe no longer talking or walking and they're experiencing that weight loss. This is when we want to have the very vital support that you get from hospice in terms of emotional support, in terms of helping you transition to that end of life and how do I keep my goals moving forward in terms of comfort and keeping them safe. So the reality is it does take a village to help take care of someone with Alzheimer's disease. You have a very critical team around you from family and friends on to your medical support network to the various agencies that are available to you. And an important part is that you help spread the word, that you teach where you can, that you advocate for your person, and that we also do our job in terms of getting out there and helping these people make sure that their staff are well trained, that there's good dementia knowledge within the community. So from the caregiver's um, prayer, I just want to um, give these few lines um, in part as we close the session today that I think are just help us remember, am I looking at a barrier or, or why am I not allowing the next step to happen? Be open to receive that which will help the wisdom of others, their kindness and their support. And I'm going to just say, those are the angels who come to you and say, let me know if there's something I can do. Have that list ready and be humble enough to allow that help. Stay open to possibilities of growing closeness, of wider perspective, and of deepened meaning. To be able to provide care for somebody, to be a care partner, a care provider, is a big gift of self and time. And when you do it and can find the, the blessings in it, the joy in it, as well as the hard times and get through it all, there can be a great sense of fulfillment, of purpose in life, of knowing that you've done something to make a difference for a person. So be open to those possibilities. And I think the last one is, as you give to another, give unto yourself too. So that I think works both ways. We want to remember, right, people are very good at spouting off the golden rule, do unto others. But we have a hard time turning around and saying, let others do unto you as you would gladly do. And the other part of that is then, it's important to give to yourself, to be able to claim some time for yourself um, so that you bring the most resilience, the most joy that you can to the equation every day. That's a lot of information we've shared today. I hope that you've found it helpful. Certainly um, feel free to listen to this as many times as you need. Sometimes what you hear at a given moment isn't pertinent to what your needs are at that exact moment. But the more you hear this information, the more it begins to make sense. You don't get blindsided. You understand things as they happen. Make sure that you pay attention to our other avenues of resource that we have for caregivers, your Beacon newsletters, your other caregiver classes, our webinars. Should you have further questions about anything you heard today, please feel free to contact us or to visit our website, www.banneralz.org.